ladies and gentlemen, can I welcome onto the stage Sophie Aldred, who's going to be interviewed by Jan Henry. <laughs> 40,000 people in Florida last week, and now you. <laughs> it's, all, it's all led up to this moment. Um, so first of all, can we just say, Ace, back on the screen. How fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, how was it for you to pick Ace up again on the screen? You've been obviously it's been a big part of your life through audios and, oh gosh, I'll shout really loud if this doesn't work, through audios and all sorts of things, but... To be back on screen, how different was that for you? How, how, how did you go back to it on screen after all this time? Well, the great thing is that, of course, uh, I've never really stopped playing Ace, thank goodness. Um, all these years, being in big finishes and even doing conventions, you know, that Ace is never far away. And so coming back was just, it seemed normal somehow. It's really bizarre. I mean, apart from the sort of initial nerves of uh, can I remember the lines? And because, um, of course, the brain is a little bit older since then. Um, and uh, and then the main thing was, I think, that we don't you don't have rehearsals anymore when you're filming. You you go straight in, and that's it. We had the luxury of rehearsals back in the day, um, and so nowadays, what happens is that you. You walk on set, you have a line read, you rehearse for the cameras, and then you shoot it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's so quick. Um, so that was the most confronting thing, really, that, and, the, and the biggest difference. As far as, um, as far as sort of things like, I don't know, the crew were fantastic. They were very similar to the crews in the old days where everybody really got on with each other so well and uh, there was a fantastic atmosphere on set and I think um, I mean it all started really when the very first day um, I walked onto the set and we were doing um, the bit the very first scene you know where uh, Ace is in the art gallery and uh, you see the back and then uh, the camera comes around like that which was brilliantly written by Chris, actually. It was, it was uh, very flattering. He said something like, you know, we, we see a figure standing in front of a painting, um, and uh, could it be? Is it? Could it possibly be? You know, the, cam <laughs> the camera pans around and a, lot, a whole load of other nice flattering stuff. Anyway, so I walked on, on set. I hadn't even met the director at this point. I'd spoken to him on the phone. Everyone's in masks, so you can only see like eyes, and it was a bit daunting. And anyway, the first thing that happened was the the first AD just uh, stopped everybody, and he said, um, "Right, everybody, I'd like to welcome back Sophie Aldred," and everybody just burst into spontaneous applause, and that was just such a lovely welcome. It was great. And then um, the cameraman Mark and I got on. Uh, very well straight away. Um, Jamie, the director, Jamie Magnus Stone, is a lovely, lovely man, and, and we we hit it off as well. I think the first day he um, he realised that uh, I'm up for kind of <laughs> doing well my all my own stunts, shall we say? The the, the, the very first. Um, uh, schedule that we had and you, you get these little sides you know for each day and the production schedule had on the front um, stunt double for and they called us A and uh, T for Tegan because they didn't want to kind of give it away if, in case the, the script fell into the wrong hands 
anyway, um, it was funny because it said a stunt double, and it was like I was a bit, oh no, I, you probably <laughs> health and safety now, you probably <coughs> can't do anything. Anyway, after the first day, that kind of disappeared somehow, <laughs> and I did end up doing uh, all the <laughs> all the stunts, which is great fun. Anyway, go on and on and on about it. <laughs> it was so exciting, it really was. And was the character how you imagined she'd be after all this time? Well, the great thing was, it was really nice because Chris Chibnall, um, he, I, I went on a Zoom with him uh, and he asked me, it was very sweet, he said, would you do me the great honour of being in the centenary episode of Doctor Who? And I said, wild horses wouldn't stop me. <laughs> and then he said, what do you think Ace would be like now? What do you think she'd be doing? What do you think she'd be up to? And I, I said, well, I think Ace is actually very much like the uh, ace you see in the trailer for the uh, blu-ray box set season 26 box set i'd loved doing that i don't know um if you've seen that trailer but it was uh, i thought that was just right that ace is kind of um ceo of a charitable earth that's what we heard in the sarah jane adventures um and she's kind of Slightly, slightly melancholy, I said to him. Uh, she's always wondering what it would have been like, and uh, um, she, and, and of course, once you've been with, once you've been travelling with the Doctor, how could your life ever be quite as exciting or quite the same again? Um, so that idea was was there. Um, and then I said to him, um, Oh, by the way, I've still got the jacket. Um, in my cupboard. Would you like me to bring that along? And his eyes sort of rolled around <laughs> in his head and he went all sort of fanboy and said, yes, yes! <laughs> um, so yeah, and we discussed what we thought um, Ace would be doing. I said what I really wanted to do was to show that um, older women have still got the same you know, spark and can still have still got it basically, um, which I really I was very keen on. So I said I want to do lots of running and jumping and stuff like that. I didn't quite know that he put me parachuting off the side, <laughs> <laughs> being shot at by Cybermen. But I was delighted. It's funny because then when we were on set, I I told Janet this as we were doing the scenes where we were running up and down uh, up the steps away from the Cybermen. I said, oh, well, she said, oh, you know, oh. and I said, well, actually, yeah, this is what I asked for, because I think it's really important that older women, can, you know, get to show you. She said, she said some um, Australian words <laughs> very loudly. <laughs> This didn't happen in yeah, yeah. I'm sure. If you swap that, yeah, yeah. there's a wired mic. Oh, I'll be able okay. to hear you a bit better. Sorry, technical, technical issues. There. Can you hear me? Great. Okay. Great. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, so you've touched a little bit on um, the, the production side of it as well. So how did you find the, the Doctor Who machine uh, coming back into it on, on, uh, on set? Was it... Was the was the scale a bit different because obviously it's been a bit reboot and there's there's a lot more behind it now, or was it essentially still um, was it still that sort of family feel you talked about from, from in lots of other interviews about being very close sort of family feel when you were making your your series back in the eighties? It was really comfortingly familiar. Um, you know, I I was actually because I thought, oh, what's it going to be like? The only real difference was the size of the equipment you know the cameras have got a lot smaller we were working on two cameras obviously e even in studio as well it was much more like it was much more like a location shoot in studio um, because you've got these small cameras in particular the main camera was a, a sort of steady cam and uh, I, I don't know how mark did it the main cameraman i mean he's gosh you must need massages all the time he was literally holding the camera uh, on his body from morning till night um, so and then they would have a, a, a there was another camera as well taking wide shots and so on um, but really it was very very familiar it was a real family feel the crew had been together for some time Jodie led the, the whole proceedings with such fun and warmth and 
she knew each individual crew member so well and uh, it was really it was very very familiar it, re it really did remind me of the atmosphere on set from when Sylvester and I were working um, it there was lots of laughter lots of um, uh, banter going on uh, Jody and Mandit were just such a lovely lovely uh, crew at the helm um, and the whole, yeah, that the, Jamie, as I said, the director was absolutely lovely. Incredibly calm. I could not believe. He was sometimes getting revised scripts, literally, as we were about to shoot them. I mean, you know, and I couldn't believe the, the kind of the calmness where he approached everything. He'd just sort of stand there and have a think, and then, you know, we'd do something. And I think it was just a testament to him and to... Jodie and Mandip, that everybody in the crew felt so kind of, um, seemed to be so happy to be there. It was really lovely. And much like in the old days, I think they'd all been working on it for such a long time that people felt very loyal to, to each other and to the programme and just wanted to produce the best that they possibly could. The sets were, were incredible. I mean, the, the set, uh, you know, the... the uh, the Winter Palace set. It it was a, a whole set. It was about probably as big as this room, if not bigger, with two floors. And it had actually been built in the studio. Um, I mean, obviously, I didn't get to film in there, but it was when we, we were we, we were sort of just went and sat there as like a bit of a green room to uh, relax between shooting bits of other scenes, which were kind of cobbled together in corners of the studio. Um, and that was incredibly impressive. And uh, the production designer, I think, is the title. I don't know the titles anymore. He was a genius. I mean, he'd just be told sometimes the day or two before, oh, we need to have this now. And then there would be the set in, uh, in the corner of the studio. So, yeah, it was, it was um, comfortingly familiar in atmosphere. I think the set's... Um, although, having said that, I'm thinking of the first time I walked onto the set ever in anything was uh, Dragonfire, and that was in Studio One in Television Centre, which is, was at the time, I don't know whether it still is, the largest studio in Europe. And that was pretty impressive as well, because we had that, the very first set I worked on was, funny enough, a double layered set where Kane is tempting Ace with the coin. And that was a massive set again. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was it was all very familiar. I thought there'd be a lot more money involved, but no. <laughs> <laughs> it seems whoever is taking on Doctor Who is always stymied by budget constraints. Um, I think one of the most powerful moments from that was there was a moment on, on screen where there was a shot with um, yourself um, and there was Tegan, Kate Stewart, Yaz and the Doctor, five women in one scene solving, saving the world, solving the problems. Um, and to me that struck me as quite a moment in Doctor Who but also in television as well. This was female, they're very different actors, very different characters and they were, they were front and centre, five of them as well. And I think that was really powerful. So how did... Did you pick up on all that? How how female-led that that story was? Yeah, it was it was an amazing moment because we just that was the moment where we met Jodie and Mandit for the first time. They they came Jodie came bounding onto the set and uh, and uh, we immediately felt completely at home with her. Um, and yeah, we were just we had quite a bit of time standing around that set in particular while they were setting up the shots. And I just looked around and I just I actually said to everybody there oh look there's five women here three of us are over the age of 50 which I think is a really big point as well and we're not talking about relationships or shopping we're, we're <laughs> saying and I do think it was it was a completely well I can't think of many other shows that have done that or would do that I mean, I'm thinking of Pete McTie's The Pact. That was very female-led, um, you know, older actresses as well, which, uh, for those of you who haven't seen that, that's, that's a, a brilliant series. Um, 
but really not, not in Doctor Who, certainly. And absolutely, as you say, a very important moment, I think. Um, and of course, the, one of the most beautiful moments I think for a lot of us was you and Syl together um, in some scenes. Were you actually physically together? There was a lot of CGI <coughs> going on. So did you actually get to meet up and do scenes together? Well, the first time we did it, um, I was in a cave in the Brecon Beacons. What's it called? You know, it's the it's the famous caves in Wales uh, that you go in and there's the, it's like Wiki Hole, but there's sort of beautiful uh, stalactites and stalagmites, and yeah, it's really lovely. I can't remember the name, but it's it, go there if you can. It's really, really lovely. Um, weirdly, it's sort of got uh, going up to it. It's quite a hill to walk up, and there's you go in a little cart, and then you have to walk the last bit of the way, and there's these sort of um, old animatronic dinosaurs all the way up <laughs> as well, uh, and sort of. Uh, fake palm trees and things. It's it's a really nice place to visit. Um, and we, I can't remember now. I think we filmed something beforehand, and then um, yes, I think I'd been working with um, Bradley's. Um, he had a double because they could only get him because he's so popular and famous and busy. They could only get him for two days total, <laughs> the whole shoot. And uh, so we'd done our bit in the, in the cave, and then they got somebody who looked very like him to do my close-ups in the Dalek bashing scene. Um, and then Jamie came up and he said, um, because, oh, this is a precursor to it, the whole Dalek bit was meant to be on an oil rig. It was meant to be, the, 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 they were meant to be drilling on an oil rig. The Daleks had taken over, and um, oil rigs all over the world. And they'd sorted out this oil rig off the coast of Wales, and um, they'd said, yeah, oh yeah, please do come and film on our oil rig. And then somebody had just at the last minute rang the American office that's, and said, um, oh, by the way, we're going to have uh, Doctor Who filming on the oil rig. Uh, next week, and they'd said, what the <laughs> they, they, they realised, oops, yes, maybe it's not such a good idea after all to have Daleks on an oil rig. No, they can't see very well. <laughs> Health and safety. So suddenly they had to rejig the whole thing, and Jamie, the director, had been to see these caves with his partner, and thought, you know, thought at the time, oh, that would be a nice place to film something. So they had to suddenly rejig this whole thing. Um, suddenly the costume designer, he'd, he'd had people on the oil rig in all these clothes that was kind of scrapped. I mean, this sort of thing happens um, in filming all the time. But um, So we were suddenly in these caves, and I thought they looked really, really good. Anyway, so Jamie had said, oh, I found a little bit for you to go and film uh, the bit with Sylvester in. He wasn't there, which was just as well, because I don't think he could have made it up the, climbed up the, the rocks. Um, so in the event, there was just me and the cameraman, Mark, and I think there was a lighting guy there. And um, I'd asked if we could possibly have somebody to read in the lines, um, because that's what you do, you know, you don't always have all the actors there all the time. And, um, and I realised that Barnaby Edwards was there because um, he'd been do he'd been inside the Dalek. And I said to Barnaby, would you mind reading in for Sylvester? He was like, <laughs> And so I said to Jamie, is it all right if Barnaby... So Barnaby was sort of perched on a rock and he'd doing his best Sylvester McCoy impression, which was great. And it was really lovely, actually, because it was a very intimate... Uh, and, and I could very easily imagine Sylvester there. And um, the camera was about this far from my face because the, the rock was there, you know, it was a tiny, tiny little place. Um, so that was, it was, I really enjoyed doing it and Jamie was very pleased with how it came out. And then a couple of weeks later, Sylvester was due to come to the studio and I was absolutely thrilled because then I'd, I think I'd given people the idea of this reading in work qu works quite well if you've got an actor who's reading in the lines, because it really helps the mood. Um, 
And so they asked me if I would come down and read the lines in for Sylvester. So I did. And so that bit, his bit, was done in the studio with green screen. And um, I'm standing in my coat and my hat and my scarf because the studio is freezing. And he's there in his costume. And it was lovely. And he, it, we both said afterwards, it was as, as though the years just rolled away. And, and there we were. And apparently, um, quite a few people had come down from the offices and were standing around the monitors. And um, on the night that uh, The Power of the Doctor went out, I had a lovely message from Chris Chibnall. And he said, oh, I forgot to show you these photographs. And he sent me a couple of photos of, uh, of, of from the monitor that he'd taken, because he was standing there, of me and Sylvester and then me and Jodie as well laughing about something. So that was lovely to have. Okay. Fantastic. It, sounds, it just sounds like uh, you picked up where you left off, really. And, and we taking really it forward did. as well. It's, it's, a new, it's a new ace we saw, but it's, it doesn't feel that at all removed from, from the ace we knew and loved back in the 80s as well. Um, of course, you never really left it behind. You've been doing audios, Big Finish, you wrote a novel. Um, so this, and all the conventions, you know, you've never put ace down. So when you left, when it finished back in 1989, did you at the time think, well, that's it, nice job, I enjoyed my time, let's move on? Or did you think, I think this is going to stay with me a bit longer, did you imagine it would endure quite so long as it has? Well, for a start in 89, it was just so sad, because we were just getting into our stride, I think, um, and Sylvester and I both really wanted to do the, the next... Uh, series the, the, the next year. Um, I, I was on what they call an optional contract, which was for half of the next series, and they were going to write Ace out halfway through, and then Sylvester would have regenerated at the end of that next season. So it always felt like, ah, we hadn't quite finished it off, you know, we, we hadn't, it, it, there was something that always felt a bit undone, unfinished. Um, and then I suppose Quite soon after that, that's when Bill Baggs was doing his Stranger videos with Colin and, and Nicola, and uh, he asked me if I'd get involved in those, so I did them. And then he was started doing the audios, the Adventures in Space and Time, and so we started doing those. So it sort of almost felt like we were still doing it, and then Big Finish. So it's, but then I do remember on the other hand. Um, when I wrote with Mike Tucker the Ace book, um, I think I wrote in the flyleaf, I think, um, who'd have thought that five years after the show finished, <laughs> I'd still be involved in Doctor Who? We'd have a version of Yeah, it was more to write. Um, so what do you think is going to be next for Ace? What would you like to see her go on to? Um, obviously, a lovely series of, with yourself and the companions and there's maybe grey in there, you know, there's, there's good places to go. What would you like to see next for Ace? Oh, I'd love to. I would absolutely love to do some kind of spin-off. I mean, you know, I'm hoping that there was that scene at the end of The Power of the Doctor with uh, Kate sitting around with the companions. And she did say that line, didn't she? I might need you to do some work for me or something like that. So, you know, fingers crossed that something's going to... I mean, I think... Uh, Rumour has it. There's so many rumours, aren't there? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm always the last to know. So, you know, you tell me. You can make out this rumour. Yeah, I think, I think so, yeah. Um, yeah, as I say, I, I, haven't, um, I haven't heard anything, and I wouldn't be allowed to say if I had anyway. Cause it's a funny, actually, I was talking to Gary this morning, Gary Russell, and the NDAs you have to sign now, it's... it's Crazy. The, um, I mean, even when you do, when I do uh, a sort of first audition uh, voice clip uh, for an animation voiceover, you have to sign an NDA for that. Every, everyone's gone a bit crazy on this sort of security leakage. I was saying to him, remember the days where we just used to chuck the scripts in bin bags to be to be shredded at <laughs> the BBC? Oh, yeah, I know. It's a shame, isn't it? So yes, the big, the, the, I, I don't know, but I'm always the last to know, but I would love to see the character of Ace 
continue because I think she's still got a lot of life left in her. Absolutely. Yeah, here, here. <laughs> Well, I think this is the year of the convention. Um, <laughs> so yes, I've already been to America. Well, I did Minneapolis in January. Uh, then um, I, yes, as you were saying, LA two weeks ago and Florida this last week, last weekend. So yeah, forgive Colin and I if we're a bit like, oh, it's <laughs> I think it's, it's four o'clock in the morning for us. So. Um, and uh, then I'm going to Aberdeen in a couple of weeks' time. And um, I'm, doing, I'm going to um, Australia and New Zealand for five weeks in April and May. I thought I might as well make the most of it. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. And then um, uh, in between that, I'm doing a lot of audio work, as I always do. So I've got two big books that I'm preparing at the moment. One is a book by Adrian Tchaikovsky. I don't know if you, you've read any of his um, really amazing series. I'm just sort of finishing off for him. It's a, at least a trilogy, I think, um, which is a very, very good um, science fiction series. Um, and then there's another one which is a sort of thriller, uh, another book in a thriller series that I'm doing for a, a writer called Adam Simcox, which again is, is very, very interesting writing. It's so funny because I, science fiction and fantasy is not my genre that I would normally choose to read. You know, I, I, I'm, I've nev I was never into it when I was growing up. But now that I do a lot of audiobooks, lots of Brandon Sanderson and so on, I really appreciate the genre now, and I'm, I'm really enjoying um, uh, science fiction novels and uh, the whole world of it. So, yeah, that's really great. And then, you know, lots of other bits and bobs of audio work, and, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty busy, I have to say. That's great to hear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so we're going to open it up now. We've couple, got time for a couple of questions. So if you pop your hand up, and we'll um, we'll come to, we'll come to you. Yeah. Would you move? Thank you. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, you might recognise a chap on your left there uh, from the, the original series. Oh, I do indeed. Do you got uh, a baseball bat? Anyway? <laughs> <laughs> that was my question. Yeah. Did you enjoy that part where you? <laughs> really went to town on it and did you realise how much damage you were doing at the time? <laughs> yeah, I really, I did enjoy that, although it had to be very carefully choreographed. Um, I believe there's an outtake where it says I, I hit the wrong Dalek, but I don't, I don't think that's right because yeah. we had to, you know, when you consider everything has to be set up so exactly, you know, I had to I hit the eyepiece and then there was a particular... Um, Bobble thing. Are they, they, have they got a name, those things? Hemispheres. What's they called? Hemispheres. 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 <laughs> I had to hit a particular hemisphere. <laughs> because it had a, uh, a spark that would go off. Um, so I can't think that I hit the wrong one. It was always slightly stressful doing stunts like that because you only had one chance, really, because uh, of the intricacy of the... Um, you know, hitting the Dalek, then I you know, slid under the desk, then I jumped up on top and all that. Um, so it was always slightly stressful and a big relief afterwards when it had gone right. I didn't realise at the time that they were going to be setting off 